Hi everybody, and welcome to our first video on numerical integration. So far in the course, every time we've wanted to find an integral, we've been able to find an antiderivative, and then if need be, apply the fundamental theorem of calculus in order to compute the actual integral value. But sometimes it's not going to be so easy. For example, say you have a graph of your function, but you don't know what the function actually is. Maybe you know the values at some of these data points, but you don't have a rule for the function. Or maybe you do have a function, but you don't know how to find an antiderivative. So for example, say I wanted to find an antiderivative for the cosine of x squared. Now a lot of the tricks that we've learned so far may look like they would be applicable here, it turns out none of them are. There is no way of writing down what we'd call an elementary antiderivative for this function. Elementary antiderivative meaning essentially using the functions we know how to play with, trig functions, exponentials, log functions, polynomials. There's no combination of those whose derivative will be cosine of x squared. Really strange. There's a lot of functions like this. In fact, say we had the sine of x over x an important function which you probably learned in calculus one when you look at the limit as x goes to zero really important function no elementary antiderivative say i did e to the negative x squared no elementary antiderivative there's just no way to do it uh, one divided by the natural log of x not going to find an antiderivative for this one either and say the square root of one plus x to the fourth Surely you say there must be some trig substitution or something we can do to find an antiderivative. Not going to happen. All right, there is an antiderivative, but only sort of in a, um, a trivial sense. If you use the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can define a function whose derivative will be this function, but it's in no sense an elementary function. So this is what the topic is going to be about. How are we going to compute integrals or at least get close? How are we going to approximate the value of an integral when we have a function where either we don't know the rule or we don't know how to find an antiderivative? All right, so let's clean this up a little bit. Give it our first try. Okay, so the first attempt we're gonna make at finding the area under this curve, well, we're gonna cheat a little bit. Uh, I could try to find the area under the entire thing. I'm just going to do a portion of it so you get the idea. Everything we say it just extends out further if, if we want to go out further. So I'm going to erase all the stuff to the right of this point x3. Okay, so I just want to find the area underneath this curve. Okay, so from x0 all the way up to x3. And the way we're going to approach it, this first one, is called a left endpoint approximation. Okay, so where's the left? Where's the right? So first thing, I'm going to divide up the region between x0 and x3 into subintervals. Okay, now I've chosen here to break it up into three subintervals. This is just the choice I made for this video. I could have used 6 or 12 or 15 or 100 or 10,000. In practice, you choose this based on, well, a lot of issues. One, how easy is it to access the value of the function at these points? Is it very easy to find those values? Is it expensive, right? In the real world, you may have to pay to get this data. Okay, so for the purposes of this problem though, I'm just trying to keep it simple. I chose three separate intervals, which gives me four points, okay? And when I say left endpoint approximation, so there's two things going on. One, I'm going to approximate using a specific shape, rectangles. Second, I'm going to choose the height of the rectangle based on the left endpoint of the interval. So my first interval, I'm gonna look at between x0 and x1. And I'm going to build a rectangle. And how tall is that rectangle going to be? I'm going to choose the height of the function at the left endpoint. Okay, x1 would be the right endpoint. So I say, okay, fine. I have a rectangle, and the height is going to be whatever the value is. So this is f of x0, or if I'm trying to be short, I'll call this y sub 0. Okay, so the input is x sub 0, the output is y sub 0. 
So that's going to be the height of the rectangle, and the base goes all the way from x0 to x1. Okay, so this gives me a rectangle. That rectangle has some area. And of course, we know how to find the area of a rectangle. It's the base times the height. So let's try writing down the beginnings of an approximation. So the area is going to be approximately, so we're going to take this first rectangle, which has base. Well, how long is it? Well, it's the distance from x0 to x1. So that's going to be x1 minus x0. Okay, imagine this was a, a 2 and a 4. How would you find the, the length? You do 4 minus 2. Okay, that's all I've done here. Times the height, and the height is the y0. Okay, so that's the first rectangle. Now I keep going, and I'm going to draw another rectangle, but this time the left endpoint will be at x1. Okay, and the interval will go from x1 to x2. So I say, okay, where do, 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 does f output at x1? Well, it's this height up here. That's our f of x1, or again, we'll just call this y sub 1. So that's the height of the rectangle. I go across to x2, make a rectangle, and now I get some more area. Okay, let's write down the area of this rectangle. Well, the base, that's x2 minus x1, and the height, well, that was our y1. Okay, one more rectangle to go. I move over and now my left endpoint is at x2. So I come over here and I say, how high is it? Ah, it's up there. Okay, so that's my y2. And now I draw a rectangle over here to x3. Move it on down. I get some more area. And I can add that up over here. Again, the, the base has length x3 minus x2. And the height, well, that was our y2. Okay, so this number that we've computed is the blue area. Is it exactly the area underneath this curve? Of course not. Is it an approximation? Well, sure. Is it a good one? Depends on how accurate you need it to be. You notice this rectangle is definitely missing out on a lot of the area. This one, eh, not so much. This one, oh, that's actually giving you more than you were supposed to get. Hey, maybe these balance out, okay? That, that could be. One thing that you're going to realize quickly is if I had chosen more points between x0 and x3, right, subdivided into smaller intervals, my rectangles would have been a little bit thinner, but they would have more closely approximated this curve, okay? So why not just use more and more of them? Of course, you could go to infinity and then you have the Riemann integral. In practice though, we don't have an infinite number of data points usually. We have some finite number. That's going to limit how close we can get our approximation. And we'll talk in a later video of how we can decide how close our approximation really is. Okay, so but this is how we can do it. Now, we're going to make one simplification to make our life easier. This isn't required, and in the real world, sometimes you can't do this. But for our purposes, this will be close enough. We're going to assume that when we subdivide the interval, x0 to x1, x1 to x2, x2 to x3, that all of these have the same length. And the reason we do that is so that in this formula, we don't have to keep changing the base. It's just going to be the same amount. And typically, we're going to call that distance delta x. Okay, change in x. So all of these we're going to assume are delta x. Which means over here, I can rewrite this. I can just factor the delta x out. That's that change. So these are now all the same. And then all I have to do is add up y0 plus y1 plus y2. Okay, so this gives me a pretty nice formula. Of course, if I had more intervals, the delta x, well, it will change, but it'll just scale down. And this will change, but just adding more terms. y0 plus y1 plus y2, maybe plus y3 plus y4 plus y5. However many uh, partitions we get, right? however many intervals here, that's how many y's we'll get. Okay, so if I give you an actual function, which we'll do in a later video, you see this is a very simple formula to use.
Okay? In the next video, we're going to set up right endpoint approximations and then see if we can find something in the middle that's even a little bit better.